Okay, good morning everyone. This is uh, Dr. Garayas for MED 230, Medical Law and Ethics, and this is Chapter 6. The learning objectives, of course, glossary. What we're going to study today, this morning, the four Ds of negligence, respondeat superior, re ipsa loquitur, what does liability mean for us, and ten ways to prevent malpractice, and the three types of damage awards. All the other stuff you guys can read on your own and all these other items kind of relate to the first six items. So let's start with the four D's. And of course the case. Make sure you look at the case. So I'm going to put the four D's right here. Okay, now, in the four Ds, let's go over a story, and this is a classical <laughs> case, but I can't find it. It used to be in a former textbook. It is about a medical assistant who uh, takes blood from a fashion model. And in New York, that's not an odd thing. There's a lot of different kinds of models. And um, it was a, um, a spring shoot for, and she needed to be sleeveless. Now, here's the problem. You guys know when you take blood, you can get a hematoma. Well, this particular uh, patient, who was a model, had a really nasty one. Now, here was the problem. In two days, she was on a modeling shoot. When she informed her agent about the hematoma, she lost the modeling job. So, she then sued the doctor's office. So, let's look at how that could be applied. And remember, this is an unintentional tort the medical assistant didn't woke up that morning and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you lose your job, or hey, I'm going to hurt you, or hey, I'm going to give you a hematoma, right? So the medical, stu the medical student, the medical assistant, we're going to show, you know, did the protocol correctly. So assuming that the medical assistant did the protocol correctly, what would the model and her lawyers have to prove? So the first one, the first D, Bullets. I like bullets. Ooh, that's that's way too big. Okay. The first D is duty. Did the medical assistant was that the medical assistant's patient? Yes. Was the medical assistant trained to handle that kind of patient? Yes. So, that answers the first question, or the first D, when they're in court. Was that the patient, and was that responsible, what responsibility to the defendant, which was the medical assistant? The second D is dereliction, or deviation from that duty. And like I stated earlier, did the medical assisting personnel, did the medical assistant, do anything bizarre? Well, according to my, to my story, no, they did not. They weren't derelict, like, uh, you know, she did, did she use the wrong needle? Did she use the wrong tourniquet? Did the medical assistant deviate from the standard of care? Nope. Was there exact damage? Well, according to uh, the model's legal counsel, there was direct damage. She didn't get the job. She didn't get paid. Was there permanent damage? Would the hematoma stay there forever? No. So, it wasn't any permanent damage, but there was damage done and loss of a job because of it. And lastly, Was the MA's actions, whether they be derelict or not, the direct cause of these damages? And that's the four Ds. You should be able to take any one of your cases and ask yourself those four questions. Duty. Was that the, uh, was that the, um, the defendant's uh, patient? Yes. Was that defendant 
their medical assistant have the ability to serve that patient? Yes. Was there any dereliction or deviation of that duty? No. Were there any damages? Debatable. Was there any direct cause? Did the MA, the MA's action, cause any damages? Well, here's what happened. It, uh, it was awarded to the medical assistant because they said yes. They had a duty. No. No dereliction, no deviation. The damages. The damages weren't permanent. And that a hematoma is what? A typical side effect of taking blood. And was there any direct cause to any damage? No, because there was no dereliction. Do you see how the, the preponderance of evidence was for who? The medical assistant. And that's how the judge decided it. I have to look up that case. It's killing me now. But um, maybe you guys... Oh, did I spell dereliction wrong? The big red line underneath it. So those are your four Ds. Duty, dereliction, damages, direct cause. You can take any case, especially any um, uh, negligence case or malpractice, and remember, the difference between negligence and malpractice, negligence is kind of like the lower level. Malpractice is the more upper professional level. Malpractice, you wanna, it's, it's more, uh, more towards uh, the MD and above. And this is, negligence is more towards, um, uh, you know, um, support staff, or um, the physician support staff. So those are your four Ds. And now, I already uh, related malpractice and negligence. And malpractice, think of something on a professional misconduct level. It is a higher standard of care. So who gets hit with malpractice? Doctors. Who gets, uh, who gets hit with more negligence? Nurses, medical assistant, the support staff. I never had. Look yep. at the last one for the four Ds. Oh, the last one for the four Ds is direct cause. Was the thing that the defendant did, did it directly cause any damage? Let's say, for example, my patient gets a heart attack. I just gave my patient heart attack meds and an EKG today. Am I the direct cause of that heart attack? No, I gave him meds and he had an EKG. I didn't do anything to that patient. Yeah, that's why, yeah, that's funny. Lawyer, that's what the lawyer said to my lawyer. Oh, because the way you talked to him, and that's what scared him into a heart attack. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that in court, sir. And trust me, I'm, there's a reason why I'm no longer a doctor anymore, because I know this too well, these 40s. I've been to court too many times for stuff that... I'm, I'm one to own up. I will own up anything. I will leave my, uh, my, my job if I'm the one who did wrong. But if you're constantly defending yourself for stuff you didn't do, or stuff that people other perceived as you did, it gets tiring after that. So, the tort of negligence. We already talked about omissions and commissions. You can get negligence because you didn't do something you were supposed to do. Or you did something that, uh, that you shouldn't have done. So these are acts of commission. Malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance. Okay? So think of it this way. Okay? Look at the examples. Malfeasance is when you did outright something wrong. For example, the nurse prescribed medical, uh, uh, described uh, meds. Can a nurse prescribe meds? No. Only the MD can. But then, not even PA. PA has to be cleared by the MD. Right? The whole, the only people is the MD, the OD, and the podiatrist. End of list. No one else should be uh, putting their name on scripts. Yeah. I thought nurse practitioners. Oh yeah, MD. <coughs> they have N they have DEA numbers too. Anybody who has a DEA number. Anybody else? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. And especially it goes and uh, so that's what you actually outright did something that you weren't supposed to do. That's malfeasance. Now, misfeasance, right? You were supposed to do something. Remember I put the chest tube in the wrong side? That's considered misfeasance. Because what did I do? I was doing the right protocol. 
Actually, it was a really clean tap. But, hello, wrong side. God, I, you know, it's been, it's been like 20 years and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Because that's what you should do. You shouldn't harp, you shouldn't harp on your mistakes, but you, you use them as learning tools. So he said <clears throat> it's when you accidentally do something? Yeah, this is m m mis improper performance. Malfeasance, you outright did something insane, right? Misfeasance, you did something what? You're trying to do something right, but you made a boo boo. You made a mistake. It happens every second of every day in the, in the hospital. Easier to remember. Now, nonfeasance, that is a what? An act of omission. I didn't do my job. I was supposed to look at my patient at 2 p.m., I didn't. At 2.05, my patient got a seizure. Man, bad. Right? What do you mean, call when your patient is in pain and you don't really like bad pain, mm -hmm. but you don't do anything about it. You just tell oh, her. Oh, so let's uh, let's look at that. Let's say she she was supposed to have pain meds, right? Mm -hmm. Malfeasance, misfeasance, or nonfeasance. I was supposed to give her pain medication at 11:30 this morning, but guess what? I was outside smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And then met somebody else. Then I had a meeting, and now it's 2 p.m. My patient's been suffering for three hours. And then I get, then I look at my pager and I'm like, oh my God, everybody in their system has been calling me. That's non-feasance. I was supposed to perform a necessary action. I was supposed to clear meds for that patient. But since I didn't clear meds, since I didn't clear orders, the entire staff cannot move. And that's non-feasance. That's an act of omission. So, the worst, bad, not so bad. Because at least I didn't do anything. This is something I did that I shouldn't have done. This is outright insanity. Malfeasance is you know the rules, you totally broke them. It's a big mistake or yeah, big mistake. Malfeasance, like you totally, totally disregarded the rules. Misfeasance, you're trying to do the right thing, but you made a mistake. You made a mistake. Nonfeasance, you totally didn't do something that you were supposed to do. And how would I ask you? Beautiful, right? A, B, C, D. Right? I'll give you a situation. So since some of you are asking about this, let me give you a situation. Right? Um, Dr. Garayas gave his patient opioids for money. He said, I can give you an extra bottle if you give me 50 bucks. Is that malfeasance, misfeasance, or nonfeasance? Malfeasance. I did something outright illegal, outright insane, outright wrong. I don't give medications for money. I can't. Now, how's this one? Okay. Um, I put in a catheter, but I didn't. Uh, but I didn't secure it. And then now the catheter now scraped the inside of my patient's urethra, and now she's now she's bleeding per va uh, per vagina. Malfeasance, misfeasance, or nonfeasance? Misfeasance. I did the right thing. I was supposed to put the catheter, but bad technique. I didn't secure it down, right? You know, there's a way. You know, you do the figure eight thing, so it doesn't come out. Doesn't. Uh, so what happened? Improper performance, and then my patient <laughs> suffered problems. And lastly, that's the easy one, non-feasance. I didn't do something that was I was supposed to do. And the classic one is meds. Yes. Right? Nothing. Remember yeah, you don't do nothing. Non, nothing. I didn't do anything. So uh, that's non-feasance. Question. Why is the example say try giving your child aspirin to bring down the fever? I get that all the time. Because how's this? Let's say you saw another doctor. Even though I'm a doctor, am I your child's patient? Duty. Does my duty lie with you or my or your child? No, it lies with what? The other doctor. I have no right to tell you stuff, to give you any advice. How about as a medical assistant? Do I have any right to give you, to tell you what to take? Actually, aspirin isn't the best thing for, isn't a drug of choice for, uh, for fever for a child. Well, like Tylenol. Yeah, or, but I, but me, if I, I, that, that is not my patient, the nurse can't even say that to me. 
But you can prescribe something. Who? Who's the only person who can prescribe and actually give you advice on your management? The doctor. The doctor. End of list. And when the nurse gives you those information, she should be reading it, or he should be reading it, from where? The management plan section of the chart. Let's say I'm a medical assistant, right? And then my patient says, hey, what am I supposed to do if my kid gets a fever? If I looked on the chart and said, and it said what? Tylenol, blah, 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 milligrams, PRN, and it's signed by the doctor, then I could say. But if I just say it off the top of my head, I remember um, there was like one show, I, uh, one of these, um, I think it was House or something like that, and one of the doctors said to their patient, you know what's really good? Why don't you have some chicken soup? Oops. Can, can I, as a medical professional, give home remedies to you? No, I have to give you what? The protocol of what, first of all, I have to be your doctor, I have to have gone through all the steps, subjective, objective, assessment, plan. And remember, whose sole responsibility is the diagnosis and the plan? The physician, end of list. All the support staff must follow that plan, not make their own suggestions. This right here, this is bad, bad. So if you're a pediatrician in a small practice and my doctor is busy seeing other patients, but my kid comes to see you, then, I see you, you, have to, you But have then to part of that practice, you'll see on the little forms that you guys sign, that the doctor, your doctor can assign Temporary, it goes, uh, temporary MDs, and that's how actually it was done. How many times, like I'm in the ER, Dr. Grias, there's a patient in the ward, they say they need to specifically see you. And I'm like, mm -mm, call Candy. She's got, she's got my ward, I'm stuck in the ER. Dr. Candy can do what? See my patients. And what do I have to do? Give me the chart. Give me a I now have to do what? I sign out, Dr. Candy has all my patients now. Go, 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 go. I gotta go. Why did the orderly come see me? Why did the nurse come see me? Because Candy's sitting there with my patients going, where's Dr. Grimes? And I go, he's not an outpatient today. He got called in the ER. And that happens every day. Like if ER gets swamped, you start pulling resources. Especially nurses. Nurses, you don't know, you future nurses, you don't know where you're going to be day to day. You can even be in another hospital. Right? So that's why I find it funny when you guys say stuff, I want to be a pediatric nurse. Uh, and he goes, good luck if you get to stay in that pediatric yeah, department. Right. <laughs> you could be in ER. Uh, how many times have I had peds nurse going, Dr. Guys, what am I doing here? And I go, we're short. She goes, yeah, but I got a ward upstairs. Nope. You're, you're down here with me. Because I'm internal medicine. I've been in ER. I've been in the ER for five days. I'm only supposed to be in the ER once every three or four days. But I've, how many times? Because we're swamped, you start pulling resources, and you'll learn that in your. If you guys uh, go to your HCA classes, uh, it's called lean management. You can't have full representation on every staff. You're going to lose money. You're going to have what? Skeleton force. It's called skeleton force. You're going to have minimal crew on every uh, on every board, and you, you start picking just to cover. Doesn't that sound insane? It sounds insane, but that's how we keep costs down, so we don't charge you a million a million dollars um, just to uh, just to be seen. So did I answer your question? Like, that's why I try giving your child aspirin, because if I say it, guess what? It's okay. I'm, your, I'm the pediatrician of your, of your child. I said it. Guess what I also have to do? I have to write it down. Patient was advised. Uh, 50 milligrams or 81 milligrams uh, aspirin, PRN, for fever. Oh, by the way, physicians nowadays will write it on a script, even, uh, even over the counter. In my pharmacology class, you're going to learn that. Even over the counter. Oh, so you teach a lot of, yeah. We write it down because I don't want to get in trouble. Because if I just say it and I don't write it down, guess what? The patient could have said, oh, but you said that you have 500 milligrams of aspirin. Then your kid bleeds out and then has, has stomach problems. Well, I'll be in big trouble. That's why I looked at him on aspirin. Jeez. You want your kid to start, you know, defecating blood? All right. Give him a whole ton of aspirin. Well, because remember, aspirin will thin out your blood and it'll thin out a kid's blood so bad, and it'll give you really bad abdominal cramps. You don't want that for a kid. Question? It's a side question. You oh. teach pharmacology? Yes, I do. I'm an MD. I teach everything. And once, uh, once I get my CPC, which they're probably going to make me do, I'm going to teach everything. Uh, I love teaching, but I love teaching, but not everything.
Yeah, some of you are already tired of seeing me. So you had, you had me a while. All right, what kind of damage can I do? This was on the reviewer for the RNA, but wasn't on the test for whatever reason. Compensatory damages. These are the different kinds of payments. So if you have compensatory damage, it's like tit for tat. Like you had $10,000 was your bill, guess what the damage is going to be? $10,000. So compensatory means what? Okay? It's like, it goes, if you have this much, you get that much. And it's never really a one-to-one, -one, as you can see here. Sometimes it's 33% or whatnot. Now, what's punitive? Punish. Punish. That's when we get into the millions. When, when the United States government or the legal system wants to make an example of you, oh, that's where you see those things like, oh, um, hospital is sued for $254 million, uh, $125 million, some ridiculous number. Last one, uh, nominal. They just want to be awarded. Now, this is why respondeat superior is so powerful. Let me write that term down because that's big. That was on every reviewer. That was twice out of 250 questions. I saw a respondeat superior question. Twice. So this is a big one. So this is Latin. Respondeat superior means let the master answer. They're not after you. They're after me. And then after me, they're after the facility. Okay? So if you get caught, uh, not caught, but um, found guilty, and the MA will receive nominal damage, guess what? Through respondent superior, the MD in charge of that particular department or that particular office will also be what? Guilty. Will also be responsible. So when they have a wrongful death suit, which is a civil suit, which means the family's going to have a problem with who? The doctor. Or the family's going to have a problem with the facility. Remember, civil suits are person to person, individual to individual. So what's that mean exactly? Uh, responding superior? Responding superior literally means let the master answer, or let your boss answer. That's why MDs are so bent out of shape all day. Because every little problem in the ward, I get blamed for. Dr. Christ, why wasn't that swept up? I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm not, he goes, uh, I'm not housekeeping. Guess what? That's my ward, I'm housekeeping. It was my responsibility why this mess here wasn't taken care of. I should have did what? I saw the mess, go, go deal with it, go call uh, nursing, go call housekeeping, because this is my ward, this is my domain, right? and I am responsible for it. If my MA, if my nurse does something wrong, I'm responsible for it because, because that is uh, that person under the chain of command. And that's pretty much how the hospital works. And also, because you, put, you can now see it puts a lot of pressure on the MDs. It's bad enough the MDs got a whole bunch of other problems. They now have to worry about what? All the rest of you. And actually, they trained, that, they trained that to us early in medical school. In medical school, they assigned team leaders. Oh, this is an awful, awful way to learn respondent superior. Mm -hmm. The team leader gets the merits of everybody within your group. So if anybody in your group messes up, you get the same punishment. And why are they teaching that? So that you will be responsible for your team and you watch over your team. And in return, your team should watch over you. But you could see how that also could go, uh, could be um, negative as well. Fraud, we already talked about. OIG, the Office of Inspector General. This is the last person you want to meet. Um, they are now part of, uh, they now answer to the Department of Health and Human Services. The OIG's only function is to look for fraud within the medical system. They look for even small stuff. Gone are the days that they're only going to look at HMOs or big hospitals. The OIG even looks for small stuff. And um, if they see something, they're trying, they're going to visit you just like the IRS. And oh, by the way, once the OIG starts finding stuff, they inform the IRS. Yeah. 
So you will be not only visited by the OIG, you'll be visited also by the IRS. If you're in a facility, they also inform JCO. So every accrediting body that you have or you touch will visit, start visiting you. How do I know this? I was part of an office that uh, was committing fraud. We got shut down for 15 days. Can, does, anyone, can, does anyone know any place that can be shut down for two weeks and survive? So what happened eventually to the office? Not. Because why? Remember what we talked about earlier today? Compliance. Follow the rules. It's better not to make less money but following the rules. And this particular university follows that. We've been around since 77. We haven't grown really, really significantly, like in the thousands, but you look at all these other schools that are all closing down, they've been around since the 80s and 90s too, but they didn't quite follow the rules. So now, they're all paying for it. Oh, by the way, and after the Department of Education gets a hold of you, they're also gonna call Sally May, they're also gonna call the IRS because guess what? Every time you have students, you're collecting funds from the federal government, and it's the same thing with patients. When you have Medicaid and Medicare patients, and you're collecting those funds, that's from where? HHS, CMS. The OIG watches you. And now everything is on electronic medical records. That means anything can, everything's going to be monitored. Heck, they, caught, they used to catch people all the time when it was paper. How much more for now when everything's electronic? Okay, last thing we're going to talk about this morning is the common defense. What defenses does the doctor and you have? I saw this on the reviewer, but I didn't see this in the actual exam. So the first one is the affirmative defense. Okay? I call it the own up defense. Yeah, I did it. Right? Or one part and parcel of that is nope, I don't remember. I have no recollection. So denial according to your textbook, is number one. I don't know, I have so many patients, right? And that's the affirmative defense. They either own up or they state, yeah, we did it, but I, or we may have done it, but I cannot remember. And I have a question out there for you to answer, and I believe it's on your, um, on one of your uh, discussions. <coughs> Is it easier to prevent negligence than it is to defend it? So, the denial defense, number one. Right? Re ipsa loquitur is his exception. And what does re ipsa mean? Is the thing speaks for itself. So, for example, it's hard for me to do the denial defense. Remember I put the chest tube on the wrong side? It's hard for me to do a denial defense because was I there? Yes. Did I physically put the tube on the wrong side? Yes. There was there witnesses? Yes. So can I have a denial defense? No. I can't say I didn't remember it because I was there. I wrote it down. I owned up. I called the attending. I'm the one who also did the repair. So re ipsa loquitur means the thing speaks out. What you did was so wrong that it was obvious. Like that. Uh, like example malfeasance. The nurse gave medications or, or uh, told a uh, patient to take medications that she was not clear to tell them to take. Not clear to take aspirin. Now, another popular is assumption of risk. Okay? That's why we inform the patient about everything. The good, bad, and the ugly. We inform them of all the because just in case it happens. And you, you see assumption of risk all the time with pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies. You, ever, you see the commercials uh, um, where they're like, oh, this is a wonderful drug, but may cause bleeding. Other side I know, effects I include death. Why? Yeah. why? Because you could die. And I said you could die, so if you do die, there's my disclaimer. I told you. I already told you. You're going to have bleeding out of your eyeballs. So why are you getting medication then? So that because well, I'm here to make money. That's why cigarettes put that on their label thing already. Oh, cigarettes always did. Right? Because ever since the 60s, 
And here's the hard part about that problem. If you're since the 40s, that, that cigarettes were horrendous to you, even though they taste so awesome. But they do a lot of bad things to you. Now here's the problem. R.J. Reynolds and friends did what? Experiments to make the cigarettes more powerful, more addicting, and more potent. And also, what else did they do? They started marketing it for kids. Why do you think, uh, uh, what was it, was it 15 years ago? Uh, did you see the um, camel cigarettes had camel cash? And all the things you could win were like all toy-like things? Mm -hmm. So if the parent had all these toy-like things in their house, like beach balls, and little cars, and little stuff, they grow up with what? Camel cigarette marketing. So when they grow up, they'll look at cigarettes as well. It's toys, it's cool. Right? It's extremely unethical. But remember, are these people part of the medical world? No, they are not. They're part of the consumer world. So the consumer world, right? Do you see, like, remember in the 90s when all these people started jumping, jumping on McDonald's throat because you're killing our kids? Hello, you're the parent. You're the one bringing them the McDonald's. So why are you blaming the McDonald's for making your, your kid fat? Right. I blame me. I could, I could try to sue Doritos. Doritos contributed to my second trimester baby here, right? But who's really to blame? Me. Because I'm the dummy who puts the stuff in my mouth. Who else? Corona is also involved here. Stella Artois, good, especially this part right here, right? I can't sue the, because it's what? An assumption of risk. That is also part why informed consent. You have to tell the patient everything that can potentially go on. Next, contributory negligence. Contributory. The patient made it worse. So for example, my father was a classic patient, right? They gave him diabetic meds and then he almost went into a coma. Then we were wondering why. He was given meds and all this other stuff. Well, could it be the three snicker bars that he was hiding underneath his bed? Yup. When we found the wrappers, that's what? Contributory negligence. The patient did things to make it worse. Here's an example. Jenkins versus Bogalusa Community Medical Center. Right? Not supposed to get out of bed. What did they do? They got out of bed. How many times uh, I've been in the assistant living where we restrain the patient and then the family comes in and they get all pissed at us? That's why I told your Nana, don't get out of bed. How many times she get out of bed? She's one year status post hip surgery. She gets out of bed again, she falls, guess what? It's on us, right? So I restrained her. Then the daughter came and got all pissed because I don't want her to be guilty of contributory negligence. Oh, by the way, she keeps on doing that. Guess what? We, we're going to have to put her in a secure ward. I don't want to do that to your grandma. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just because she's being a jerk. Can you explain that to like the patient's family and stuff? Or I try. That's when they show up, or if they show up. Mm -hmm. That's also the other sad part about assisted living. The family, they show up like never. And then the one day they show up, they'll see some They'll see something they don't like, and now they're now they're calling the shots. They crack me up. These families crack me up, and I'm like, all right, whatever. Yeah. Does whistleblowing apply to any of this? Well, remember, our F standard. Something we must. It's it's unlike other industries where I see something, I'm gonna keep my mouth. Shut. There is no ethical standard. What is that's why that's why business or corporate America. That's their standard. Their standard is to do what? Make money. End of list. We're medical. Our standard is to do what? The higher standard of care. That's why that guy, the pharmaceutical company, that guy, Sancavelli, that's why the whole world's after him, because why? Even though he's in a retail business, he is part of the medical world. The pharmaceutical companies are part of the medical world. And it's not right to charge 500% on a drug that costs you pennies. That is extremely unethical. But you can see how unethics got him in the poor spotlight. Then what happened? Stock plummets, all these other problems plummets, and guess what happened in Saga Valley? Got fired. See how this works? Right? Living by the higher standard. Now, it's one thing other people are doing horrible things. Uh, you don't want to know the, um, uh, how they created insulin. I mean, they, they did it just enough so it can make the Medicaid Medicare caps. 
which is messed up, which is smart though, right? It's not going to get on the news. It's going to raise your profits for this year because uh, do we ever get a year where we have, you know, ethics? It's America, home of, home of supersizing. We don't have supersizing anymore. It's just big, right? I, saw, I, I got the normal sized uh, Wendy's hamburger. I was able to cut it to feed three people just one burger because it has enough. Uh, I shared with some of you who had my AMP class. The single Big Mac meal has enough kilocalories that, that you don't have to eat uh, uh, breakfast or dinner. You need just the lunch and that, that should suffice your maximum amount of kilocalories per day. Dang. If, you get, if you get just the meal, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's around 4,000. And that's enough for a day. Well, and a lot of people who are actively dieting go what? Around 2,500 2, kilocalories per day? Right? 2,000 to a two is really pushing. You get really, really hungry. I get really hungry around four, so. <laughs> oh, I, I once documented uh, when I was in medical school, I was eating close to something like eight or 9,000 kilocalories a day. Because that's all you do is eat. You don't have time to do anything else. So that's what athletes eat, but athletes work out that can young. You're gonna have problems. So negligence, I can't sue anybody, can't sue your companies. Now comparative negligence, okay? That means a little bit of we did it, and a little bit of patient. So you shouldn't charge me the full amount because I did some wrong, but you did some wrong too. And that's comparative negligence. Borrowed servant doctrine is a um, is part and parcel of the respondent superior. Remember what I, we talked about earlier that if you work for the hospital, they can put you anywhere. They can put you in any ward and even in other hospitals if they choose so. Well, then you're going to have borrowed servant. So let's say, for example, you guys are with me today, right? We're part of uh, Inova Alexandria, but Inova Fairfax needs help. When you guys go over there to Inova um, uh, uh, Fairfax, then you, of course, medically have to answer their chain of command. You don't talk to me when you're in their hospital. So the employee remains the servant of my employer, but so that any mistakes you make in Inova Fairfax, guess what? Comes back to me because I recommended you to go over there. So, again, do I win? <laughs> no, it, the hits keep on coming. So ultimately, so when you guys become the boss, guess what? Because everything will be on you. So those of you who are interested in healthcare administration, because you're in your responsibility. Because guess what? You're the one who scheduled them. You're the one who probably vetted them. The doctor sees the MA for like 10 seconds. He goes, yeah, yeah okay, they're good. But you are the one who has to say, okay, they have the right credentials, they have the right attitude. And when they don't have the right credentials, don't have the right attitude, and don't do right by the, um, uh, by the patients, guess who ultimately has to pay? You, right? So you can see how there's a lot of burden on management. But it's good because it makes you responsible. We've all had bosses who had, you know, were like, eh, whatever, you know, they show up whenever they want. Now you can see why. Medical, uh, people who manage medical facilities, they don't show up whenever they want. They show up every day just as much as everybody else. Statute of limitations, of course. Anytime you get convicted of something or whatever, um, there's a time limit, okay? So most statute of limitations I've stated here is they don't start, the clock doesn't start ticking until there is discovery of what you did wrong. So let's say, for example, I killed a patient in 2003, but they found it today. Guess what? I have to not defend myself. Okay? That's why most doctors, uh, such as myself, they scan and keep every patient. Of every patient that I've seen in medical school. That when lawyers call me when something goes on, once in a while they do, they want to see something, right? It's called discovery. They want to see if they, um, and they do audits. Hey, Dr. Rise, did you see this patient in 2001? Her name is blah, 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 blah. I go, give me a social security number. Okay, I look in my terabit drive. Boom, I hired two high school kids to scan everything. 
and they did a pretty darn good job of it. So now I have a scan of the entire chart, and then I put it in a PDF form, and I send it to uh, the hospital and their lawyer, whatever. Out of 10, I always come back, thank you much for Dr. Grimes, and I, and I ask, are any charges on me? And then they, goes, they ask you, do you see anything in the mail? Go, nope. And he goes, then you're good. And then every once in a while, I have to go, then I have to go to court.